Good evening, everyone. Welcome to First Aid AMC MCQ. I am Dr. Arshan Ahmed, and I will be the mentor of your AMC MCQ course for the next five months. So I can see a lot of you are in Facebook. So if you want to come to Zoom session, that's also fine. If you want to stay on the Facebook, you can use the comment section. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. And also, I can see most of you are on Zoom. So if you have any questions throughout our class tonight, you can always ask it just by writing it on the chat box. We keep you muted throughout the class. It's just making sure that there is no outside noises coming out. Sometimes we see that like you guys are talking in the background and the class can become quite noisy. So that's the main reason why we keep you muted. But any questions, any queries, feel free to write it in the chat box. So first of all, this is a trial session for your AMC MCQ course. And we are very excited to do restart one of our course, which is very highly recommended for passing your AMC MCQ exam. And you must have heard from your senior brothers or sisters. You must have heard from our previous course students about this, and that's why you are here today, right? And you must have also know about our course details. So this course has almost everything that you need to pass your exam. If you don't waste, if you don't want to waste your time on on looking for a lot of lot of materials, a lot of courses, which can just keep your keep your preparation time longer and longer. What we do is that we make your preparation concise in a way. If you follow what we are doing, you will pass this exam. But I always say to everyone that we can only show you the way to pass the exam. But the hard work, the, the studying, the reading, those, those things are obviously a part of your journey and which you have to do by yourself anyway. But the, the guideline is very important because none of you are working in Australia. And if you don't know what we practice in Australia, then, then preparing for an exam is very hard, especially, obviously, you are preparing for AMC because you want to be a doctor in Australia. And you should have, a, have someone as a mentor who, who is working in Australia. So I've been working in Australia for quite a long time now. I have experience in both hospital and general practice. So I... I will guide you throughout your journey. And many of you, I know that I will see you being a doctor in Australia in the next few years. And I have seen it for, for the last seven or eight years. Many of you, I will remember your name and you just started today. And then maybe in the next two years, you will be a doctor in Australia. So that's what you should think of. When you dream about something, dream big. When you start preparing for something, you don't stop until you finish this. Now, this is not something which is very easy and straightforward. There is always, always curves. There is always failure. It is hard work. But trust me, those hard work will pay it off. But you have to give time. You have to sacrifice your, your good happiness, your memories, and a lot of things. The, there, there are sacrifices. To, to pass this kind of exam, and everyone does it. But at one point, when you will reach to your dream, that's, that will actually erase all these bad memories. Now, this is the first part of your being a doctor in Australia, right? And what I suggest to you is to go a step by step. Start with the MCQ. Don't think about, well, what I'm going to do about MC Clinical, because I heard AMC clinical is very hard to pass. I heard that I can't get a job even after passing the exam. Should I prepare for AMC? Those thoughts are just for, for those people who, who, doesn't like, who doesn't want to take risk, who, do, who, who is af afraid in everywhere. Now, even if you appear any exam, like if you appear any postgraduate exam in your country, are these also very easy to pass? No, none of those. Like if you're appearing for uh, like MDs or any of those exams, those are also very, very hard to pass. So 
in the other hand, you are, you are trying to be a doctor in Australia. So that exam obviously going to be hard, but it doesn't mean that you can't pass it. If you have a proper guideline, if you know what to read, where, from where to read, what are the materials in, is important, then this exam is easy to pass. Initially, it is quite confusing because, because everything is new, right? And many of you even, even you did not read about media psychiatry for, for the last 10 years. Many of you, and most of you actually, you went to a particular subject, like you were doing cardiology, surgery, something like that, and you forgot everything about gynean obstetrics. Maybe you forgot about medicine fully. So AMC, MCQ means that you have to regain all those subjects again. You have to gain the knowledge of each and every subjects that you have gone through in your medical life. That's, that's what is AMC, MCQ. If you have to just, just make sure that you, you restart your preparation in a way that you have a good basic ideas about, about the important topics that come in exam. Now, first aid AMC MCQ is one of the highest passing rates out of any courses available in Australia. So, and every five months we are taking this course and we see a huge amount of candidates who join this course. And you meet a lot of, lot of doctors from all over this world. You make friends, you make, you make lot of study partners, and then you, you take your preparation. So this is not about just preparing alone. It is a preparation which, which involves study partners, which involves group studies and everything. Because if you just want to finish, finish the exam alone, it is hard because the, the point of having some study partner is to, is to gain some knowledge from them also, gain some experience from them, and also, you can share the load of solving a lot of questions for this exam. As you know that in AMC MCQ exam, there are two different ways of preparation. One is having your theory knowledge and using that theory knowledge on solving questions. Both are important. If a course is just giving you theory, or just giving you recalls or question solvation, that's not enough. You need to have something which has both. And our course has those combinations. So in every week, we ensure that we have our theory classes, which is most of the time will be taken by me. And then there will be some question solvation classes based on recent sample questions. And together, you can actually have all the important information that you need for this exam. Solving question is one of the hardest thing for this exam. So we are going to help you in that. And that's, that's gonna save you a lot of time, a lot of reading from a lot of websites. And that will be the part of our mentors as well to show you how to solve questions. What are the important topics that are coming in exam? So that's what we are going to show you throughout the course. There is a good news for you that we have we have been trying to add new mentors to solve questions so that you can have more question solution classes with us. And we have got quite a good amount of mentors now. So you will get, now previously we used to take three classes in a week, one class, two class on theory and one class on question solve. And in some weeks we used to take two question solve classes in a week. Now we are going to take two theory class in a week and also two question solve classes in a week. So most of the classes in a week. And that's more than enough to have an extensive amount of question solve done in your five months. The next thing I want you to understand that when you choose a course, it's important to understand that even to understand about AMC MCQ preparation, you need a good amount of time. So if a course asking you to finish the course just in two months, I'm sure that after two months, you, most of you will be like, well, what happened? I, I can't even understand what I have to do now. So why we take a five months course is to give you a prolonged exposure to our mentorship and prolonged exposure to our support so that when your two or two and a half months is over, you are going to getting well adapted 
with this exam and you will start asking questions you will start to understand the basic of passing this exam and on the latter half of the course the course becomes much more interactive because now you become more well adapted and that time is one of the important part of your preparation if a course is finished within three months what how you're going to ask questions after that not only that even after finishing the course we extend our support to the students as long as they try to pass the exam so we'll go through the course details after this psychiatry trial class so that you understand what we are going to add into the course. Okay, so let's move on to AMC MCQ preparation. So because many of you are just new and beginners, I'm going to give you a basic idea about what is AMC MCQ exam. And you must have a lot of questions about your future like what i'm going to do after passing the mcq what i'm am i going to get a job or not so those answers we are going to take a career guideline in few weeks time and in that class we are going to answer each and every questions that you have okay so tonight is mainly focusing on amc mcq exam preparation and we are going to do a psychiatry trial class so that you have an idea about how our theory classes will look like so mcq exam is a software based it's a computer adaptive software based exam which means that you have to go to a exam center and in that exam center there will be lots of computers and you will be getting one computer and in that room there might be 16 20 students which also appear in the exam but everyone's exam paper is different because it's the software who is giving you that questions based on your answer it is a 150 question exam and you get 3.5 hours okay so 150 questions 3.5 hours the past score is 250 out of 500. Now, if you see that there is an AMC scale that the AMC follows, they scored the candidates from 0 to 500. So you must be thinking that how 150 questions are marked as 500. No one knows. Okay. So, no one knows about the AMC marking because every questions are different marking. There are some questions which are just marked as two, some questions four, eight, even ten. So there is no way you can know which questions carries high mark and which questions carries low mark. But out of 150 questions, there is 130 scored questions. And 20 questions are pilot questions, which means these are not scored. Again, you don't know which one is scored and which one is non-scored. But it is assumed that the last 20 questions that you get, so from 130 to 150 questions, these 20 questions are vital part of your exam because none of these questions are pilot questions. These are all scored questions, and this carries high marks. Why? Because AMC knows that at the end of your exam, you will be most likely you will be running out of time. So they give all the all the high marking questions at the end. So that's why it's important that you 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 know the timing well, and you don't waste time on a particular question. Okay. So now, how you get if you can get two fifty out of this 500 you will pass this exam if you do if you even get 249 you fail the exam and there's a lot of candidates who gets just 249 okay so this is how the amc scale works now i can see that you are asking a lot of questions about the schedules and everything so we will discuss that at the end of the end of this exam class so just wait for the end of the class and then you will discuss about the course details
Okay. So now for AMC MCQ exam, as it is a software based exam, what actually happens is that let's say your number one question is an easy question and you got it right. So the second question AMC will give is a little bit harder. If you still get it right, then the third question will be a little bit more harder. So it will just get harder as you get it right. And the marking will also go up. If you get something wrong, and then the next question, it will become a little bit easy. So that's how the software is designed to give you exam questions. So if, if you get all the easy questions in your exam, don't just think that you are going to pass the exam because likely chance you missed a lot of, lot of questions answer and that's why the questions was easy. We have seen a lot of candidates who come after the exam and said, uh, Dr. Arshan, my exam was very hard. Everything was very new. I have never seen these questions before. And I'm sure I'm going to fail this exam. And one month later, when we see the result, that candidate passed the exam. The other candidate who said, Doctor, I got all the recall questions. I, I think I'm going to pass this exam. That candidate failed the exam. So it's all about luck, but it's also about understanding that, that sometimes just because your exam, exam questions were hard doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to fail the exam. So don't lose hope on that part. So the next thing is how you're going to go question one to question 150. So that nowadays there is a lot of changes in, in AMC exam. So first of all, few things are important that because this is a software based exam and you know that as part of the course, you are going to get into our portal and our portal has exactly the same question format, uh, just like AMC. So you will be able to appear these 150 questions in our portal as well. And you'll get a good idea how this exam works in real time scenario. So the main thing is that AMC, MCQ exam, the questions, so if this is a question, then there will be five options. So from A to E, and every question is a single, single answer. Sorry, what, so what's happening with the voice? So if voice is breaking, what's the problem with the voice, guys? Sometimes what happens is that in your end, if you are using a microphone, it sometimes it can be like that. So have a look that if that is the case. Okay, some people are saying voice is clear. So I'm not sure like what's happening. I haven't changed anything. We have been taking classes like this. Okay, it, sometimes it could be that laptop's fan is, fan is getting a little bit working. So don't worry on that part. Just try to listen to what I'm saying it should be all good. But if it is becoming really bad, just let me know. Okay, let's move on. So if you still have a trouble, let me know. So we can all again restart. But the background noise sometimes, let me see that if the Zoom has done the background noise part. Just give me a moment. Okay. 
Okay, I can see a bit, it's fine. Should not be a trouble. So if anyone having trouble, just maybe just try to like either use a headphone or get off your headphone. That sometimes causes the problem because we have been taking classes like this for a while. No, no one actually talked about background noise or something like that. So let's move on. So I have been saying that how the exam questions come in exam. So if your number one questions will be like, there will be a questions and then it is A, B, C, D, E. So all the questions answer is a, just a single answer. You don't get multiple answer in a question. You can only go to your next question after you choose a question, choose an answer in here. So if you have chosen option B, then you click on next button, then only you are able to go to the next. Once you go to the next, next question, you can't come back and you can't change your answer. Okay. Now this is a very important thing because previously that was not the case. You could, you could finish your number one to number 150 and then you could review your answer you could even flag your answer and you can come back but now you can't come back and you can't change your answer so once an answer is chosen and you have gone to the next question that's done okay so this is important to understand so this is how you will go from question number one to question number 150. if you don't choose an option there will be no way that you can go to the next phase so in that way you will be just losing your time and if you don't go up to 150 question and you don't finish the exam your exam will come as fail so you have to finish 150 question to pass this exam so if you think that well i don't have time i will just finish up to 130 question and if I can get 250 out of that 130 question, I'm, I'm good and I'm going to pass the exam, that's not going to happen. For your exam result to come or for your exam result to get published, you need to finish 150 questions. Okay, so these are vital information that you need to know before you start your preparation. So what are the important topics that we need to prepare? So for AMC MCQ preparation, your main preparation should be focused on medicine because 30% questions come from medicine, 20% from surgery. Then you have got gyne and obstetrics. You have got pediatrics, psychiatry. Psychiatry is very hard. And that's what we are going to focus on today because most of you, you haven't gone through psychiatry in your medical life because that was not not very important in our medical universities, but in Australia, psychiatry is super important. And sometimes we also, you will also go through the statistics and biomedicine. So these are all the, all the main topics or patient groups from where the exam will come. Okay, so you can see that it's everything, but you don't need to get any, you don't get any questions from physiology, biochemistry, or or any of the like anatomy, like your MRCP exams or other exam. The good thing about AMC is that it focus on, on the main topics. So medicine, surgery, gyne ops, pediatrics, psychiatry, and statistics. All good. So let's just start with our psychiatry class tonight. I'm, I hope that you will, you will gain some, some basic knowledge from psychiatry. And this is not just our final class on psychiatry we take more classes on psychiatry into the course but this is just a just a first class on psychiatry you can think so what are the books that you need for psychiatry preparation the main book that we follow is always john mutter that's the eighth edition and this is the current edition we are following we also follow kaplan step to ck book which is always we keep it beside the jam so this too is your main book, you can say. Some of the websites that we can follow is Range CP, Medscape. And one of the important thing that you should not forget to read is UWorld USMLE. UWorld USMLE Psychiatry has a lot of discussion about basic psychiatry. So if you, if you can read the 
answers and understand why they are choosing that answer, that gives you a very good idea on psychiatry. So UOL USMLE psychiatry is important to go through. Not the whole UOL, just the important topics that we are going to discuss into the course. And our first aid ANC MCQ lecture note has almost everything integrated in one note. So you don't need to make any note by yourself. We have it done for you already. After we have done our psychiatry preparation, like we take three or four classes on it, then we are going to do a psychiatry question solve as well. And that will give you a good idea. You can also go through some Q banks like Amidex, M plus X, any of those available ones, just to get some idea about questions. Okay, so these are the main resources that you need to follow for psychiatry. Now, let's start with psychiatry. So tonight we are going to start with depression, psycho, like psychosis patients, bipolar disorders. Those are the important topics we are going to go through. So let's start with depression, but don't get depressed yet. So major depressive disorder. A 70-year-old woman was recently admitted after her son informed the doctor that she had been doing very poorly over the last few months. The patient reports 70 pound weight loss, decreased concentration, feeling of helplessness and hopelessness, decreased energy, depressed mood and decreased sleep. So all of these symptoms are a criteria to diagnose major depressive disorder. So we follow the DSM-5 criteria to diagnose MDD, which is major depressive disorder. So if a patient had got at least five out of these nine symptoms for at least two weeks, you can diagnose that patient as major depressive disorder. Out of these nine, criteria one or criteria two, one of them has to be present there. So criteria one is low mood and criteria two is loss of interest, which is also known as anhedonia. So these two is the integral or most important feature of depression. And then you have got others. Now we follow a mnemonic to remember these nine symptoms, which is M side caps. So M for low mood, then S for sleep problem. So either patient having difficulty in sleeping or having more sleeping. Which one is common? Difficulty to fall asleep or early morning waking up in the early morning wake up, these are the more common sleep disturbance that we see in depression. There are some atypical sign of depression also, like patient with depression sometimes can have hypersomnia, which means they are sleeping more than usual. I for loss of interest, G for feeling guilty, hopeless, worthless, helpless, E for lack of energy, so fatigued, tired, C for lack of concentration or attention. Then A for appetite chains. So commonly patient will have loss of appetite and loss of weight, but atypical symptoms can be increased appetite and increased weight. Then P for psychomotor changes. Most of the time depressed patient will have psychomotor retardation. So what is retardation? Patient will be very slow. So slowed down on everything that they are doing. In atypical symptoms, patient with depression sometimes can become agitated. So those are some of the atypical features of depression. So there are three main atypical features of depression. One is hypersomnia, then increased appetite and increased weight, and psychomotor agitation. And then there is suicidal ideation. So these are the nine symptoms. Out of these nine, if a patient has five symptoms, lasting for two weeks, that's the time we can diagnose them as MDD. The question can ask you, which symptom out of these nine is the most important symptom that you have to ask in a, in a depressed patient? What will you think in that case? So two questions. One is that what is the most important symptom to diagnose MDD? And the second one is, what is the most important question 
that you need to assess in a depressed patient. The, the first one, the first question is obviously the most important to diagnose is either low mood or loss of interest. And the second question answer is the most important thing that you have to rule out in a depressed patient is suicidal thought. Most important. So questions come in this way. They don't ask you that which one is the symptom of major depressive disorder. So they ask you in a way so that it becomes a little bit confusing. But you should remember that most important symptom to rule out or to assess in a depressed patient is suicidal thought. Okay. Moving on, the two, the two key criteria to diagnose MDD is depressed mood and marked loss of interest or pleasure persisting for at least two weeks. And the other criteria we already know. So this note has everything collected from JM and Kaplan State to CK. Now DSM-5 class classification has also divided the depressive disorder into few others. So one of them is the major depressive disorder. Second one is disruptive mood dysregulation disorder, which is not important for exam. You have got persistent depressive disorder, PDD, and PMS or PMDD, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So what is persistent depressive disorder? It means that if a patient has got long standing depression of mild severity, lasting for at least two years. So that's called persistent depressive disorder. Now, most important out of any of this is major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder has been divided into mild, moderate, and severe. Now, few other things to know is that what is the worst prognostic feature in a patient with major depressive disorder. The worst prognostic factor is if a major depressive patient, depressive disorder patient also having psychotic feature, like hallucination, delusions, that's the worst prognosis. Some of the atypical features we already know that increased weight, increased appetite, and increased sleep. Treatment we will come later on. Before we move on to mild depression, Let's just go through a little bit about depression in children and adolescents because it is hard to diagnose depression in a child. Okay, so sadness is common in children, but depression also it can happen in a child, which is characterized by feeling of helplessness, worthlessness, and despair. The main thing is that adult who has depression they mainly present with low mood, loss of interest, whereas children they don't come to you with no mood. Rather, irritability, ang anger, outburst, those are more prominent than sadness. And obviously, they can have sleeping difficulty, not enjoying their meals, poor concentration at, work, at, at school, and low performance in their school. So those are the main symptoms of depression in children and adolescents. So, What is this recurrent brief depression? Now, even before that, I want to ask one question to you that if we need to manage a depression patient, the management is depending on the severity of depression. Is it mild, moderate, or severe depression? In case of mild to moderate depression, most of the time, our initial treatment will be psychotherapy, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. So what is cognitive behavioral therapy? In cognitive behavioral therapy, you will send the patient to a psychologist, not a psychiatrist. So there is difference between psychologist and psychiatrist. Psychologists are counselor. So you are going to send the patient to a psychologist who are going to listen to the patient's problem and they will try to motivate the patients. Then they will try to change their negative thinking to something positive. So that's called psychotherapy, or most of the common psychotherapy that we offer for depressed patient is CBD. So mild to moderate depression patient usually will start with the psychotherapy, not medication. 
Whereas when it is a severe depression, the main main management should be medication plus CBT. So what is the common medication we use for a depressed patient? The common medication is SSRI. So SSRI includes all those medications, which is fluoxetine, fluvoxamine, cytolopram, cytolopram, okay? Then you have got sartrolin. So those are all SSRI. Now, which one is more like the question comes that well you have got a child who is having severe depression and the question asking you that what is the most commonly used anti antidepressant in this patient so tell me one question that what is your what is the most common most common antidepressant that we use in a children Yes, so very good. So fluvoxamine and fluoxetine, those are the most commonly used. Out of fluvoxamine and fluoxetine, fluvoxamine are preferred. If fluvoxamine is not in the option, then fluoxetine will be our answer to choose. Very good. Okay, now moving on to the next topic, recurrent to brief depression. So there is a condition called recurrent brief depression in which patient presents with recurrent episodes of depression, but the depression is short duration. You know that to diagnose major depressive disorder, you need at least more than two weeks of symptoms. But in a recurrent brief depression, it's just less than a week depression. So patient will have depression, but it lasts for three to seven days and it will come almost every month. So that's why it is called brief depression. As a rule, in these patients, antidepressants are not effective. So what is the effective treatment for this kind of patient? Lithia. And obviously, you can send the patient for psychotherapy such as CBT. So CBT plus lithium is the main treatment for recurrent brief depression. There is a condition called seasonal affective disorder. So seasonal affective disorder is winter blues. So some patients, they only get depressed during winter season, and that's just seasonal. The treatment is psychotherapy, phototherapy, and sometimes medication. Now, this is a useful management guideline. As we discussed already, if it is mild to moderate depression, psychological therapy is the main stay of treatment. So you can ask me that how we know that it is mild to moderate. There is no one or one or more way to, to know which one is mild, moderate, and severe. It's about when a question say that patient having active suicidal thoughts, that patient is severe depressed. So severe depression has more risky. So a patient has access to weapon, patient has planned to commit suicide, or patient has lack of support. So those patients are most of the time high risk patient and they have severe depression. But if a patient is not severe, like they don't have any active suicidal thought, they have enough support at home, they don't abuse drugs, that most of the time you can keep it as mild to moderate. So mild to moderate treatment is psychological therapy for severe antidepressant. So let's have a look to this question so that you can understand what we are talking about. So a 72-year-old man comes to the office due to worsening depression and insomnia since his wife died seven months ago. The patient experienced lethargy and episodes of tearfulness. He has little interest in socializing with his married friends anymore. He has attended three sessions of psychotherapy but it's not going anywhere. Patient continues to feel depressed and now experiencing severe insomnia. Difficulty falling and staying asleep, staying awake at night. He feels very guilty about her death and believes he should have done 
more for her during her final months. The patient experienced a moment of severe depression last week in which he briefly thought of suicide because there is nothing left for me in this world. He also said that he doesn't want to act on these thoughts. Physical examination shows loss of weight since wife's death. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step in the management of this patient? So you already understand that this, this patient has most of the features of major depressive disorder. Like you can see, there is lethargy, so one, tearful or low mood, two, lack of interest, three, you have got insomnia, four, you have got guilty, five, suicide, six. So this patient already has got six symptoms. And if we want to know that is it mild, moderate, or severe, what will you say about this? It is severe, right? Because patient has active suicidal thoughts or patient wanted to commit suicide. So obviously this patient needs medication, right? So, so far we have only given psychotherapy. So psychotherapy is not going to help in this patient anymore. Now come to the options. You, you have got increased frequency of psychotherapy, prescribe amitriptyline. So amitriptyline is a tricyclic antidepressant and continuous psychotherapy. Prescribe metajapine. So metajapine is an antidepressant, kind of a different brand of antidepressant, continuous psychotherapy. Prescribe Jolpidem. Jolpidem is benzodiazepine. Provide reassurance and continue psychotherapy and recommends electroconvulsive therapy. ECT is our last resort for, for the depression patient. So we don't choose ECT unless we have tried all other steps. So what will you choose in this patient? Most of you are going with C and some of you are with B. At least that's good that you are not choosing others. So obviously, we know that psychotherapy is not going to work. We know that this patient did not even try any antidepressant, so we don't need to go for ECT just yet. Reassurance is not enough. We don't give benzodiazepine in a depressed patient. And it is not a recommended form of medication in Australia. If we give it, it has to be a very short period of time. So the viable options are either amitriptyline or metajapine. Among these two, metajapine is more commonly prescribed because TCA or tricyclic antidepressant are our second line of antidepressant. So first line is always SSRI. If SSRI is not there, then SNRI such as venlafaxine, desvenlafaxine is an option. Metajapine is also very commonly, commonly used antidepressant. How it is going to help this patient? Because this patient having insomnia. And metajapine is a very good medication for insomnia as well. Right? So you will see that metajapine will be much, much better preferred over amitriptyline in this patient. Okay? On the top of that, obviously for a 72-year-old, amitriptyline can cause a lot of side effects as well. So it's not our best option anyway. Now, moving on to the commonly used medication side effects. So many times questions come in the exam from the, from the pharmacological side effect. It's very, very important. So you need to know the common medication side effects. So the SSRI side effects, so almost all the SSRI has a similar kind of side effect profile. So commonly they can cause insomnia, sedation, appetite change, nausea, dry mouth, headache, Sexual dysfunction is common, and many of them can also cause GIT upset, like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. Those are very common. And then there are some others which you can go through. You can see here that these are the common SSRI, fluoxetine, cytalopram, cytalopram, sartaline, paroxetine, and fluvoxamine. The question that come in exam from here is important. So we will discuss some of the important ones. So the first question is, a patient has been started with sartraline. 
100 milligram four weeks ago. And the patient is now complaining of severe nausea, abdominal discomfort. What you will do? So sertraline is a SSRI. So we know that it can cause GIT side effect. So what are you going to do in a patient who is on a, like any specific SSRI and they have GIT upset? Now the option could be two things. You will have to see that if the 100 milligram sertraline is able to control the depression of the patient. So if it is say that patient's depression is well controlled, then you can try to reduce the dose from 100 to 50 milligram and see that if the GIT side effects are better and if the depression is also well controlled. Now the problem becomes that even with the 100 milligram, if the patient's depression is not well controlled, then you can't reduce the dose because it's just not going to help the patient. So in that case, what we do is that we will switch the sartalin to a different SSRI. So maybe from sartalin, we can use paroxetine, fluoxetine, any of the SSRI. Okay, so you will need to, need to see the whole question to decide what you want to do. If a patient is already on 50 milligram, then we don't go, like, we can't reduce the dose anymore because 50 milligram is usually the ideal, ideal dose or it's a starting dose of sartalin. So in that case, if patient taking sartalin 50 milligram and having significant side effects, then reducing the dose is not an option. You will have to switch it to another SSRI. Many times, the other SSRI that you are going to use it might not give GIT side effects like this one is giving. So this is one type of question. The second question is tricky. A patient on paroxetine for four weeks and patient having sexual dysfunction. So if a SSRI causes sexual dysfunction which is very common side effects as well what are the options that we have got now this one doesn't have that option of changing from one ssri to another ssri because almost every ssri will give the patient sexual dysfunction so changing it to some other ssri is not the best choice but for git side effect some it's all about how a patient tolerate that medication so you can change it to another SSRI in that case. But for sexual dysfunction, the option of changing to another SSRI is no longer valid. So what are the options you have got? Number one option is that if the patient is on high dose and patient's depression is well controlled, we can try to reduce the dose. If dose reduction is not possible, what option we have got? Anyone? not just adding the another drug just yet the other option will be to switch to different form of antidepressant yes very good so switch to other class so other class could be snri could be even metazapine so some newer antidepressants you can try so it is not switch to same group it is switching to some other group of antidepressant that sometimes can help even if the second option doesn't help, the third option is to add sildenafil like Viagra. Okay, so these are the step by step approach for sexual dysfunction caused by SSRI. So these two are very commonly used, commonly, commonly asked questions in the exam. Good question, Dr. Amima. So how do we switch from one class to another or how do we actually change the medication? So antidepressant changing is not just very straightforward that you, you start a medication, you stop it and then take another one. It's not like that. 
So we follow a specific approach when we change antidepressant from one to another. Could be sartalin to paroxetine, could be sartalin to tricyclic antidepressant, doesn't matter. What we follow is that if you need to change an antidepressant, you will need to give some washout period. So what is this washout period? So we call it washout period. So the washout period means that if a patient taking sartalin, even you stop it today, the effect of sartalin can stay in their blood for the next two to three days. For fluxetine, it can be there for a week. So if you start a medication just after finishing or just after stopping sartalin, what will happen that you have given one SSRI, patient's blood has already sartalin still now. So they can have more and more serotonin in their blood. And what can it do? It can cause a complication called serotonin syndrome, which we are going to discuss just in a few minutes. So idea is to take some break. So if you need to change from sartalin to amitriptyline, so you will stop the sartalin gradually. So you first sartalin 500, sartalin 100 milligram for a few weeks, then make it 50 milligram for a few weeks, and then you gradually stop it. So you gradually wean it off. Once the patient is stopping, no medications for, let's say, two to three days. So this is the washout period. And then you can restart any chiptonin as a low dose, and then you go up. So this is how you will do changeover of any kind of antidepressant, or even switching from one to another, we follow this approach. Is this quite clear for everyone that how we do it? So never stop an antidepressant just in, in a day. Gradually wean it off so that patient can't even get a withdrawal effect. Is this clear, guys? Okay. So for Dr. Parindu, there is no specific days or weeks. For, for every medi medication, there is a guideline that how many days you need to give the washout period. So if you, if you search antidepressant, like switching antidepressant Queensland guideline, you will find out that how many days you need to give a washout period for each of these medications. So there is a very good guideline that you have to follow for this. But it's not like for every medication there should be a three days time. So each and every medication has a definite washout period that you need to follow from that guideline. Okay. No, it, it cannot cause worsening of symptom because patient's blood is still having that serotonin, right? Even if you stop it today, during that washout period, patient's blood will still have some serotonin left. It can cause a little bit of worsening of symptom, but anyway, you are starting a medication within a day or two. So it's all good. And you need to also let the patient know about that there can be worsening of symptoms during this time. All good. Now, moving on to metajapine side effects. So metajapine is very commonly used medication. The main side effect is that it can cause severe sedation. It can cause constipation, drowsiness, increased serum cholesterol, weight gain, fatigue. But the most important thing is severe sedation. What are the common side effects of venlafaxine and desvenlafaxine? So venlafaxine and desvenlafaxine are SNRI. So these are also commonly used antidepressant. So for venlafaxine, desvenlafaxine, the commons are nausea, headache. It can cause insomnia. It can also cause loss of appetite. It can cause dry mouth. Now, this is the one medication which shows some weight loss. Every other antidepressant causes weight gain, but venlafaxin sometimes it, it can like lose weight because it can help with loss of appetite. But it still, it is not significant. So if in a question, Patient is very concerned about gaining weight from antidepressant. 
then the better option to choose is venlafaxine. But there are some serious side effects of venlafaxine as well, which is hypertension, seizure, increased risk of suicidal behavior initially. Like in the first one week of taking this, the risk of suicide is high. Okay? So these are very common. And you should also remember that you should not use Ifexor or this venlafaxine in a patient who has got severe hypertension or uncontrolled hypertension. Now, the next thing is serotonin syndrome. So, serotonin syndrome, as you might got an idea, that if a patient has got excess serotonin in their body, it can cause a serious adverse reaction, which is called serotonin syndrome. So, it is a rare side effect, but it is a serious adverse reaction to the use of SSRI and other serotonergic medication, including St. John's work. The symptoms usually coincide with the introduction or increase of a serotonergic agent. So sometimes what happened that patient went to a GP, GP started one SSRI, and then patient is taking it for, let's say, two months, and then it's not working. Patient go, goes to another GP and saying that, doc, I'm, my depression is very bad. I don't know what to do. And patient did not say that patient is already on antidepressant or patient forgot about it. The next GP started another antidepressant. So what happens now? Patient taking two SSRI, and that can cause serotonin syndrome. Sometimes, if sudden increase of dose can cause it, if a patient taking SSRI, and maybe they are taking opioid medication like tramadol, some illicit drugs, antiemetics, lithium, selegeline, this can also increase serotonin in their blood. Like if a patient took SSRI and then had a severely binge drinking, so severe binge drinking of alcohol can also end up causing a serotonin syndrome. So those are the main, main cause of having a serotonin syndrome. And how these patients will present to you? There are some mental status changes, so CNS symptom, muscle abnormality, and autonomic abnormality. So common presentation is agitation, confusion. Patient can have tremor, shivering. They can have hyperreflexia, hypertension or hypotension, tachycardia, fever, diarrhea. So this is how it looks like. So a patient who is coming to you with sweatiness, so diaphoresis, the pupil is dilated, so mydriasis, agitated, aggressive, tachycardia, hypertension, increased bowel motion causing diarrhea so it means that everything is hyperactive they can have tremor hyperreflexia and clonus so these are all the important signs of diagnosing serotonin syndrome so what will you do if a patient develops serotonin syndrome doesn't matter whatever antidepressant patient is taking stop it immediately so you stop any offending agents. So you can see the offending agents should be withdrawn immediately and then supportive treatment should be initiated. Okay, so that's the treatment of serotonin syndrome. If a patient, so if these are all, all the things will be supportive treatment. Sometimes even patient might need an ICO admission in this case. Now there is a common condition which is which can get confused with serotonin syndrome that is called NMS, neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is related to schizophrenia medication or antipsychotic medication. So serotonin syndrome is related to SSRI, whereas NMS is related to antipsychotic medication. The onset is abrupt in serotonin, gradual in NMS. The most important difference between this is that serotonin syndrome causes clonus and tremor, whereas NMS causes diffuse muscular rigidity. Reflex will be increased here and decreased in NMS. Pupil will be dilated in serotonin syndrome, normal in NMS. So it's very important to differentiate between these two because many times in the question, it will be given patient taking both antidepressant and antipsychotic. So you can't just diagnose based on that. You have to diagnose based on the symptoms and sign. 
So these are all the important side effects of the commonly used medication for depression. As you can see that it looks like just depression, but there's a lot to learn from here. So once you start antidepressant, how long the patient needs to take it? If it is initial onset of depression, patient needs to take it for at least 12 months. And if there is subsequent or recurrent episodes of depression, then ideally two to three years. It is written two to three years in JM, but in other guidelines, they have written as three to five years. So any of these two are fine. Okay, so that's all about depression that you need to know. Any question, guys, so far? Are you understanding everything that I'm saying? Very good. Now let's take a five minute break before we go to the bipolar disorder. Okay, five minute break guys. And in between this five minute, just either take some drink, drink some water. So just revive yourself and then we will start with bipolar and also we will have psychotic conditions to discuss today.
All right, everyone, let's start again. So some of your questions. So when using SSRI, if patient gets sexual dysfunction complication, is it better to decrease the dose or change to SNRI? It depends. So if a patient is on high dose of SSRI and if the depression is well controlled, then you can reduce the dose. So better to reduce, try to reduce the dose and see if it works. And if it still doesn't work, then you can change it to some others. Yes, bupropion is, an, is a good option. That's an alternative antidepressant that we can use in these patients. So bupropion, metajapine, those are also very good options. Yeah, so these classes are recorded classes, so you will be able to revise it later on. All good. Yes. Move on to bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder means that it's look like this, as you can see on the picture. So at some point, the normal stage looks like this. Some stage patient goes into depression phase, and at some times they go into manic phase, which is like very high mood. So depression is a very low mood, whereas mania is very high mood euphoria. So when a patient has this kind of frequencies, they're mostly in the depression, but at some, at some points in their, in, the, in their life, they get into few manic or hypomanic episodes. That's the time we call them as bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder is a broad term, which includes mania, hypomania, and depression. And it's basically mood swings. So what is the criteria to diagnose mania? The patient needs to have abnormally elevated mood for at least one week and three or more of these features. So what are the features? Inflated self-esteem or grandiosity. So they feel they can do everything. They have high self-esteem, decreased need for sleeping. So they say that, doc, I don't feel like I need to sleep. I have lots of energies. Talkative and accelerated speech. So very loud talkative speech, racing of thoughts or flight of ideas. So patients are patient thinking about a lot of things at one point. So they are, they are thinking about getting a Nobel Prize or on the other hand, they're thinking about watching a movie, going to buy a car. So a lot of thinking at one point, that's called flight of ideas. Patient will be quite distracted, increased goal-directed activity. So they will be like a patient who, does a, who just sits alone in their home, suddenly they, they are going out, buying, buying from different, sh different shops, getting, getting, to, like, getting into multiple community clubs, getting, getting to know each other, calling everyone. So suddenly becoming more goal-directed, that's also mania. And they will also take a lot of risky, risky behavior in this time. Most importantly, these behaviors will be severe enough, which will cause impairment of their social, occupational, and personal life. So we follow this mnemonic called DIG first. So D for destructible, so poorly focused. I for insomnia, which is decreased need for sleeping. G for grandiosity, increased self-esteem, flight of ideas, lots of goal-directed activities, talkative rapid pressured speech, and thoughtlessness, which is risk-taking behavior, like engaging in, in sexual activities with unknown people, financial risk, traveling, or driving recklessly. So these are the main features of mania. So to diagnose mania, the symptoms needs to last for at least one week, and it has to be severe enough to cause the impairment in their life. So what is hypomania? Hypomanic patients have all these symptoms, but the duration is less than one week, and the symptoms are not severe enough to cause impairment in their social, familial, or occupational life. Okay, so mania and hypomania, these are all important, and this is part of bipolar disorder diagnosis. So we divide bipolar into bipolar one and bipolar two. So have a look on this question, a 19 year old, college student is taken to the school counselor after he fails several classes. 
The patient is enrolled in numerous classes, most of which have conflicting times. Grades are poor, yet he seems undisturbed by this. He is also enrolled in numerous organizations such as chess club, drama club, student government, sports, and at least two other fraternities. His speech is pressured and he has psychomotor agitation. So this is mania, right? So bipolar one means a mood disturbance in which patient symptoms are, they have elevated mood for at least one week that cause significant distress in their level of functioning, which means that if a patient has got features of depression most of the time in a, in a year and just few episodes of mania, that becomes bipolar one disorder, okay? So bipolar 1 disorder has one fully fleshed manic episode and they usually have depressive episodes. Whereas bipolar 2, they have mainly major depressive episode with at least one hypomanic episode. So which means bipolar 1 has mania plus depression, bipolar 2 is hypomania plus depression. And we already know about the inherent features of mania as we can see here. Hypomania we already discussed. So what is the management of acute mania? Acute mania management comes in exam frequently. This is a medical emergency because this patient will require hospitalization to protect themselves as well as the others. So even if a patient doesn't want to get admitted, most of the time we can't force them if they don't want to be admitted. But this is one of the scenario where you can admit the patient without the patient consent. So this is one of the time where involuntary admission is necessary. So patient can't go, okay? It may be a first episode or a relapse due to poor treatment compliance or substance abuse. Now, the main thing is that, what is the main difference between mania and hypomania, Dr. Amima, is that mania and hypomania, the symptoms are same but is the duration. So mania duration has to be at least one week and hypomania, the duration is less than one week. The symptoms are more severe in mania, less severe in hypomania, okay? But the treatment, everything is same. So acute mania, the main treatment or the most effective treatment for acute mania is antipsychotics. So what antipsychotic is first line medication? Olanzapine or Risperidone. So this olanzapine or risperidone will be our first line choice for acute manic patient. If there is both options between olanzapine and risperidone, which one we prefer? We prefer risperidone commonly in Australia than olanzapine. Then there is second line. So if these options are not in your exam, then you can choose haloperidol or any other second generation antipsychotic like eripiprazole. You can choose lithium. You can choose a mood stabilizer such as sodium valproate or carbamazepine. If a patient with mania is aggressive and trying to harm you, then obviously the patient will not take medications orally. You have to choose something IM. So in that case, haloperidol IM would be our choice. All right. So Haloperidol is a typical antipsychotic or first generation antipsychotic. So this, this is something which we don't use as our first line. But obviously, if a patient is aggressive, you can't ask the patient to take a medication orally and then they will just take it. So in an aggressive patient who might harm you, to settle them down, you might need to just go for haloperidol IM. But if a patient is not aggressive, then the first line medication should be either risperidone or olanzapine. So that's the treatment for acute mania. Now, it's not just the end of bipolar disorder management. Most of the patients will have a recurrent bipolar disorder. So if a patient has got two or more episodes of either mania or depression in the previous four years, that patient will need a prophylactic medication as a maintenance medication, so every day. So as part of prophylaxis, to prevent further episodes of bipolar disorder, the, the common medication we use is lithium. So lithium is the best maintenance medication. 
If that is not available, then you can choose any of the second generation antipsychotic like olanzapine, risperidone. If that is not available, then you can even choose some mood stabilizers like carbamazepine, valproid, or lamotrigine. If a patient is on lithium, we need to make sure that the lithium is that the blood level of lithium is in target level. So you need to check the plasma level of lithium to make sure it's not the patient is not taking more than they need because lithium toxicity is also very common and it can cause a lot of side effects also so if you are suspecting lithium side effect you can do a lithium blood level also so you can see a us study recommended lithium as the primary mood stabilizers so what are the side effects of lithium lithium can cause a fine tremor muscle weakness weight gain GIT side effects, it can cause hypothyroidism and it can cause nephrotoxicity. So, this too is important. So, mild lithium toxicity is mainly GIT upset, so nausea, vomiting. It can cause tremor, hyperreflexia. Moderate is mainly hypertonia, rigidity, hypotension. And in case of severe, it can cause cardiovascular collapse, seizure, or coma. So what is the treatment? If you suspect lithium toxicity, the, in case of mild to moderate, your main treatment should be stop the lithium and then start the patient with IV fluid, ideally normal saline, because most of these patients will be severely dehydrated. And also to protect the kidney, to, give, to have nephrotoxicity, IV fluid will be a very good idea. But in case it is a severe lithium toxicity or patient's lithium level is more than four, in those situations, you have to go for a straight dialysis. So if a patient has got cardiovascular collapse, seizure, coma, or their lithium level is more than four, then dialysis is the indication, otherwise IV fluid. So we discussed about mania, like acute mania management, we discussed about prophylaxis for mania or bipolar disorder. How to manage a bipolar depression? It is important to know that sometimes if you just give antidepressant in a bipolar patient, the patient can get a manic episode. So that's very important and it comes in exam also. It is one of the recent exam questions that if you start a patient with antidepressant because you got all the features of depression in that patient and you started with antidepressant and the patient came back after four weeks with a manic episode so what is the cause of manic episode it is the antidepressant induced mania because if you use antidepressant only in a bipolar patient that patient will end up getting a manic episode so what you can do in that case so idea is to not to just give solely antidepressant with antidepressant you should add some mood stabilizers so any of this lithium valproate carbamazepine any of the mood stabilizers should be added and then antidepressant you will have to stop it within one to two months and then just continue the mood stabilizers okay So that's how we, have, we manage bipolar depression. Not just antidepressant, we give some mood stabilizers also. We stop the antidepressant after a month and continue with mood stabilizers. Good. Now, let's read this question. A 27-year-old man is brought to the office by his wife due to her concern that he has not been himself for the last three weeks. She says that he's depressed and withdrawn, sleeps 14 hours a day, has no energy or interest in looking for work or participating in any activities. Patient was hospitalized six months ago for an episode in which he became aggressive. He also had staying up all night, gambling away all their savings, investing a large sum of money in a startup company that became bankrupt. At that time, patient spoke very rapidly, was convinced that he had a brilliant plan to achieve world peace. So you can see that six months ago, 
he had a mania now he is having depression so this patient having bipolar depression right so which one of the following medication are the most appropriate for the maintenance treatment of this patient so that's the question so what are you going to choose carbamazepine and fluoxetine so this is Carbamazepine is a mood stabilizer. Fluoxetine is an antidepressant, so that's a viable option. Lithium and quetiapine. So there is no antidepressant in here, so that's not an option. Lithium and sartaline, that's a good option. Luracidone, risperidone, that's both of them are antipsychotic, so not an option. Valproate, clozapine, again, both of them is just for mania. Valproid haloperidol, that's also just for mood stabilizers, right? So the only options you have got is A and C. So we know that out of A and C, lithium is usually the best option as a maintenance treatment. So along with that, we have got sartaline also, that's an antidepressant. Okay, so that's your answer. See that how the question will come in your exam? If you know the theory, then it's easy. If you don't know the theory, you will not even understand why the answer in here is C. All good. Now, there is another thing called persistent depressive disorder, which is PDD. We already discussed about it. This has a name called dysthymia. Can we leave out fluoxetine because patient is a young male known it? Patient can, patient can take fluoxetine in a, if it is a young male, but we just need to monitor the patient so that they don't get a increased suicidal thoughts in the initial one week. So it's not contraindicated to give fluoxetine in a young person, although it is quite commonly we use it. What is cyclothymic disorder? Cyclothymic disorder, it is a chronic disorder characterized by many periods of depressed mood and many periods of hypomanic mood for at least two years. Okay, so cyclothymic disorder is many periods of depressed mood and many periods of hypomanic mood for at least two years. So if a patient has got a lot of, lot of episodes of depressed mood, and hypomania for two years that's cyclothymic disorder and for those patients obviously your mood stabilizers are the common treatment so lithium carbamazepine valproid these are the drug of choice now commonly you will come to this depression versus grief so Depression versus grief is important to, important to understand because sometimes in exam, you will just get very, very confused. So what is grief or bereavement? Grief or bereavement means that most of the time, if a patient lose someone who is near to them, as part of that, as part of the death, the patient will be sad, glo gloomy, tearful, having like decreased sleep, sometimes even they can see or hear that person. But any grief or bereavement should not last more than six months. Ideally, it should, it should get better. Okay? So, but many times we see that patient who has grief, the, the episodes of grief can last more than six months. When it is lasting for more than six months, the term becomes complicated grief or complicated bereavement. So that's one thing. And obviously depression, we know that depression symptoms can continue and continue for a long, long time. And the main thing is that in grief or bereavement, there will always be a history that patient has lost someone. Depression doesn't necessarily mean that they will just lo lose someone. It can be with anything. All right. 
And in case of grief or bereavement, the treatment is mainly supportive psychotherapy like counseling, but depression, sometimes even you might need to go for medication. Have a look on this one. A 50-year-old woman is taken to the hospital after neighbors find her wandering the streets, mumbling to herself and gesturing. When approached, she begins to cry and express thoughts about hurting herself. Examination reveals scratch marks on both her forearms and questionable laceration on her throat. When questioned, she reports feeling depressed since her husband died five months ago. She reports a decrease in concentration, feeling of helplessness, hopelessness, and hedonia, quit her job and staying at home. She now has begun to hear her husband's voice asking her to join him. Which of the following would be the next step in management? So this patient, obviously, you can see there is suicidal thoughts going on. Lots of other information is here. So begin a trial of antidepressant, refer to psychiatry, electroconvulsive therapy, assess for thoughts about suicide, refer to the outpatient department for follow-up. The main thing in this case is D. Very good, everyone. Assess for thoughts about suicide because you need to first make sure that if this patient having an active suicidal thoughts or not. Because if it is just like, if it is not an active thought, patient doesn't have a plan to commit suicide, you are still, you can just keep an eye on the patient, send for psychotherapy. But if the patient having active suicidal thoughts, then obviously you need to send the patient to hospital. Okay. So this is how sometimes grief or complicated grief can come. Now this patient, can we just say that this patient having a like a normal grief no we can't just say that patient having a normal grief because normal grief doesn't give suicide so you can see patient is like expressing thoughts about hurting there is a scratch mark there is laceration on the throats so all of this suggests patient having some obviously patient has tried to commit suicide but we need to just make sure that that like what is the thought now? Does the patient wants to commit suicide? Or it, these are only like patient tried before? So it means assessment. This is called risk assessment about suicide. So you need to go in deeper in here to find out what happened. So why there is a scratch mark on your arm? Why there is laceration on your throat? So you're just assessing about those thoughts. That's important to do first. Okay. Once you have done that assessment, then you can decide that what you want to do about this patient. Is this patient safe enough to go home? Or if this patient needs to go to the hospital for, for an active mental health treatment. Okay. Now, other part in this question is that this patient has got a suicidal thoughts. This patient, you can see that having loss of concentration, feeling of guilt or hopelessness or helplessness loss of interest so this patient is not just having grief symptom he is she is fulfilling the criteria of major depression along with that these voices also you can say this patient has got a severe depression with psychosis okay because by five months time the voices should not be there so ideally between five to six months, these voices should not be there. So likely chance that either we can say it is a complicated grief, but if the patient fulfills the criteria of major depressive disorder, then you can give it as major depressive disorder with psychosis. Okay. Now the question is that. You, you have to read it in here that when approached, she begins to cry, express thought about hurting herself. So she's expressed thoughts about it. Every time in MC, MCQ, if there is an option of assessing, okay, if there is an option of assessing something, explaining something, talking about something, that's our main 
answer always we will choose. So assessment is important, even though we know that this patient likely to be having a suicidal thoughts, likely that she has tried. In here, they have written that there is a scratch mark, questionable laceration on her throat. So you need to find out more detail about this scratch mark, more detail about these lacerations, finding out if the patient has got any other access to the weapons. So all of those you will need to assess. It's not about just this patient saying, I want to commit suicide, and you just stop asking questions there. You need to go a little bit more deeper about these questions. And the main thing is that if there is an option to assess more, that's always our best thing to choose because assessment is the main thing before we give any, any kind of management. Okay, this patient is not escaping away from you that you can't give the management, but if there is an option of assessment in the exam, most of the time, that is what we are going to choose. And the question is that why we can't begin a trial of antidepressant? The main thing is that we are going to do it. It's not like if we choose the D option, we can't choose A or we can't choose any of the other. It's about what will be your next step of management. They're not asking you what is the most appropriate management. So the in here it is about next step what is our next step so before we start some medication or we are referring the patient to a psychiatry or someone first thing is we go a little bit more deeper assessment about the suicidal thoughts or the suicidal behavior that we can see in this patient okay and always remember one thing guys that we think that every question that comes in exam, we have to choose the best option or the best management. It is not about just best management in AMC MCQ. Most of the time, they want to know what is your initial management for this patient or what will be your next step of management. Okay, so don't just jump to the conclusion every time. It's all about a step by step approach in a psychiatric patient. If there is an option of assessing a patient more, even if we know that, even if there is a sign of suicidal thoughts or suicidal attempt, if there is an option of more assessment, we will always do the assessment first. So assessment is the first step. After we assess the patient, after we take a more deeper psychosocial history, mental status examination, then we will choose, are we going to start the patient with antidepressant or we are going to send the patient to the hospital okay so it depends so that's all about bipolar disorder grief and psychosis moving on to schizophrenia so schizophrenia or psychosis very important for exam so to diagnose schizophrenia, we need at least six months of symptom. You can see in here that men have earlier onset and common onset group is 15 to 25. Schizophrenia is more prevalent in low socioeconomic groups. The prevalence is important. So this comes in exam, these ratios. So you can see that if there is one schizophrenic patient, parent, 12% risk in their children, two schizophrenic parent, 40% risk, first degree relative, 12%, second degree relative, 5 to 6%, monozygotic twin, 47% risk, dizygotic twin, 12% chance. So this risk or percentage comes in exam. You need to memorize this. So how to diagnose schizophrenia? To diagnose schizophrenia, patient needs two or more of the following, and each of them should be present for a significant period of time. Now, what are these symptoms? One is delusion. So delusions are abnormal belief, and those beliefs are most of the time some bizarre delusion or bizarre beliefs that even like those beliefs doesn't make any sense, something like that. Hallucination is if a patient seeing something that you can't, that's visual hallucination. 
If patient is hearing voices, that's auditory hallucination. If patient can feel some strange things going on or creeping on their body, that's tactile hallucination. Then there is disorganized speech. Disorganized speech means that whatever patient is saying, it doesn't make any sense. So that's disorganized speech. Patient can be grossly disorganized or having catatonic behavior. And they can have some negative symptoms like flat affect, social withdrawal, poverty of thoughts. These are all common symptoms. But patient needs at least one of these three symptoms to be diagnosed as schizophrenia. Okay, so delusion, hallucination, disorganized speech, grossly disorganized behavior, and the negative symptoms. So these are the five symptoms and out of these five symptoms, patient needs at least two or more. And also, at least delusion, hallucination and disorganized speech should be there. So that's how we diagnose schizophrenia. And you can see that patient will have these symptoms for at least six months. Before diagnosis of schizophrenia, you have to rule out that these symptoms are not due to some substance abuse. So that's must because sometimes patient, if they are having intoxications with any illicit drug, they can present to you with exact same feature of schizophrenia. So always try to rule out drug-induced psychosis before, before, before diagnosing someone as schizophrenia. All right? So this is the previous slide, Dr. Shukoni. You will get these slides in Kaplan Strip to CK anyway. Let's move on. So there are some positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. So positive means the symptom that is not present in a normal person, but it is present in a patient with schizophrenia. So delusion, hallucination, thought disorder and disorganized speech or behavior. What are the negative symptoms? Negative symptoms mean that the things that is supposed to be in a normal person is absent in a schizophrenic patient, such as flat affect, poverty of thoughts, lack of motivation, social withdrawal, and reduced speech output. So these are the signs and symptoms of schizophrenia. Okay. So differential diagnoses are amphetamine, hallucinogens, marijuana. So we, as you can remember that we say that always try to rule out drug-induced psychosis first. So what is the management for schizophrenia? Drug. The main treatment is medication. So medication, most of the time at the moment, we are using the second generation or atypical antipsychotic, not the first generation anymore. So the typical antipsychotic that you can use is either risperidone or olanzapine. If response is inadequate in three weeks, then you can increase the dose according to the guideline. If there is no response after four to six weeks, then you can change it to an alternative second generation agents. Like you have used olanzapine, then you can try risperidone. Or you can take, try a first generation antipsychotic like haloperidol, chlorpromazine, these are not commonly used anymore. If a patient having acute psychosis and quite aggressive to you, or patient might be harmful to other staff member in hospital, in that case, parenteral medication can be needed. So the common parenteral medication is haloperidol. We can use olanzapine IM also. So these are the common two to IM medication that we can use, but most of the time, haloperidol IM will be used in an acute psychotic patient. And as, as part of chronic management, any of these olanzapine, risperidone, quetiapine it can be used. So what is called drug-resistant schizophrenia? So drug-resistant schizophrenia means if you have tried three antipsychotic in a patient with a maximum dose of those three antipsychotic still patient schizophrenia is not well controlled that's drug resistant schizophrenia what is the management for it 
a trial of clozapine. So clozapine is the last resort, and we try not to give this medication because of its side effect profile, but this is the most effective antipsychotic, but it is the most dangerous one because it can cause cardiotoxicity, it can cause blood dyscrasias. Okay, so in case of drug resistant schizophrenia, the treatment of choice would be clozapine, but you have to monitor their CVC or full blood count to make sure patient doesn't develop blood dyscrasia. If a patient on clozapine gets chest pain, you have to rule out cardiotoxicity by doing an ECG and troponin. Even after using the clozapine, still patient symptom is not controlled, then you can go for electroconvulsive therapy. Okay, so that's what we call as drug resistant schizophrenia. So, summarize the treatment of schizophrenia. So, mainly it's about medication. So, schizophrenia patient, you will start them with antipsychotics. So, any common antipsychotic, which are second generation, is the treatment of choice. So, you will start with either risperidone or olanzapine. If there is no change in the symptoms in three weeks, you will increase the dose. If there is no change in four to six weeks, you can choose a different antipsychotic. Okay, that's the treatment. And in case of drug resistant schizophrenia, you will try clozapine. If clozapine doesn't help, then ECT. Now, just like your antidepressant, antipsychotic has also some common side effect profile which comes in exam. So, what are those? First one is acute dystonia. So acute dystonia patient presents with a kind of a bizarre muscle spasm. And most of the time it affects their face, neck and trunk. So just an unusual kind of muscle spasm. And the usual treatment for this is binge dropping. Then there is akathisia. Akathisia is characterized by unusual restlessness. So patient is moving their legs and foot, just like moving all the time. They can't sit in a one place. That's akathisia. You can reduce the dose, or you can use any of these, either propanolol, benzotropin, or diazepam, and that can also help with it. So dystonia is muscle spasm. Akathisia is restlessness. Then there is Parkinsonism. Patients sometimes can get features like Parkinson, especially they can have motor Parkinson disorder, which means that they can have Parkinson-like gait, which is kind of a slow shuffling gait. And patient can also have like bradykinesia, that means slowness of their movement. So when a patient develops Parkinson-like effect, you can either lower the dose, or you can use bench dropping or bench hexa. So any of these two will be will be fine in this patient. There is one another side effect called tardive dyskinesia. Tardive dyskinesia is an abnormal involuntary movement of the face, mouth, tongue, and trunk. Now it mainly happens with a long-term antipsychotic medication, and it can occur months or years after starting the treatment. So it's kind of an involuntary movement of their face, mouth, and tongue. So what you can do in this case, the first thing is that you can either stop the medication if drug withdrawal is not effective. You can use tetrabenazine. So that can also help sometimes. So tardive dyskinesia is not very commonly asked. The common side effect that is asked in the exam is akathisia. Okay, and dystonia, these two. And the other one is that NMS, neuroleptic malignant syndrome that we discussed. So neuroleptic malignant syndrome, it is a potentially it's a fatal adverse effect, and it can it can develop at any time. So patient will come to you with high fever, muscle rigidity, altered consciousness. That and patient obviously will be on an antipsychotic medication. Think about NMS in that patient. Stop the medication straight away and start the patient with IV fluid. If it is 
quite severe, you can use bromocriptine or dantrolene. All right. So these are the common side effects in a patient who is taking antipsychotic. And it comes in exam, so you need to know about it. Tardive dyskinesia is not irreversible, but sometimes it can be quite hard to, to, to make it gone because there is, it is very difficult to manage a tardive dyskinesia. So those kind of things usually doesn't come in exam. Now, the important one that's come in exam is the second generation antipsychotic side effect. So the one that we have discussed so far, those acute dystonia, akathisia, those are more common in typical antipsychotic like haloperidol, chlorpromazine. Those causes this kind of side effects more. Whereas second generation antipsychotic like olanzapine, risperidone, and a lot of others like eripiprazole, quetiapine, this causes different side effects. And those are common because we are using these medications more commonly. So you can remember mainly from here, eripiprazole comes in exam, clozapine, olanzapine, quetiapine, risperidone. So these are the commonest antipsychotic that we use and also comes in exam. So if you look over here, First, start with clozapine and olanzapine because mo more or less these two are same side effect profile. So clozapine, it causes dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, so diabetes, orthostatic hypotension, so postural hypotension. It is one of the highly sedative medication and obviously it can gain weight. Same with olanzapine, it also causes the same side effect profile. So dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, not that much of your orthostatic hypotension, sedation, and also weight gain. How about quetiapine? Quetiapine also same side effect profile, dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, orthostatic hypotension, sedation, weight gain. Now these three are same. Whereas, if you look at risperidone, it's a different side effect profile. So, risperidone commonly causes hyperprolactinemia, which means patient will have galactoria, okay, like milky discharge from the, beret, from the breast. So, hyperprolactinemia is common. Orthostatic hypotension is also common. And then there is eripripazole. Eripripazole has very less side effect. So you can see that no hyperprolactinemia, there is no sedation, no weight gain. So why don't we use eripripazole? Because there is no side effect. Because it is also very, it's not very effective also. Okay, so quetiapine and eripripazole, these are least effective antipsychotic. That's why we can't use them, although they have a very less side effect. Now, the, why we actually need to know about it? Because questions come from here. So let's say a patient is on risperidone and coming to you with milky discharge from the breast. What are you going to do? Your first option would be to see that if you can reduce the dose of risperidone and if that helps. If not, then you will have to change this to some other, other antipsychotic which doesn't give hyperprolactinemia. So the best option will be eripiprazole. If eripiprazole is not in the option, then quetiapine is your next best option. A patient is on olanzapine and developing diabetes or weight gain. What will you do for that patient? The first step is to advise the patient to do lifestyle change. If that doesn't help, then you can change it to eripiprazole. Okay? So these two questions come in exam. So make sure you know how to deal with it. So these are the side effect profiles that you need to know for, for these antipsychotic medications. Now we will very quickly go through some other psychotic disorders. So there is a condition called brief psychotic disorder. If both eripiprazole and quetiapine in option in, in risperidone induced galactoria, 
NEP puzzle is best. Okay. So brief psychotic disorder. Brief psychotic disorder means that a patient will have all the features of schizophrenia, but it's all about the duration. So when the symptoms are more than one day, but less than 30 days, that's what we call as brief psychotic disorder. Okay? And obviously for this patient, treatment is also antipsychotics. What about schizophreniform disorder? Patient will have all the symptoms of schizophrenia, like hallucination, delusions, everything, but the symptoms should be more than one month, less than six months. So that's why if a patient having symptoms less than one month, that's brief psychotic disorder. One month to six months, that's schizophreniform disorder. More than six months, that becomes schizophrenia. Treatment is same. So what is this schizoaffective disorder then? So this is a little bit tricky. So you can see here, patient having schizophrenia symptoms as well as affective symptoms. The affective symptoms include the mania, hypomania, and depression. So if a patient has got features of psychosis and also bipolar disorder, that's the time you call it as schizoaffective disorder. So patient will have period of symptoms meeting criteria for major depressive disorder, mania, or mixed episode. They will have symptoms of schizophrenia, and they will have delusion or hallucination at least two weeks in the absence of any mood symptom. Have a look on this question, then it will make sense. A 25-year-old woman is found walking nude in the shopping mall. When asked why, she replies, I am making it easy for others to have sex with me since I know they all want me. She states that she heard a voice telling her she was irresistible and everyone wanted her. When she speaks, she can't focus on one topic at a time. Her mood is euphoric, her affect is labile. So what you can see here, hearing voices, so psychosis, you can see patient having euphoria, labile affect, and flight of ideas. That means patient is having manic episodes right now. She recounts an episode last year all, where although she did not have any elevated or depressed mood, she heard voices. So this is the last one, deletion or hallucination for at least two weeks in the absence of any mood symptom. So the main thing is that when a patient has got both psychotic features as well as a manic, hypomanic or depressive feature, you can think it as schizoaffective disorder. So question is how to treat this patient. So these patients, you can start the patient with antidepressant plus or minus anticonvulsant like any mood stabilizers. If antidepressant doesn't help, then you have to consider adding an antipsychotic. Okay, so first antidepressant and or or any mood stabilizers such as valproate, lamotrizine, anything, lithium, any of those. If not effective, then antipsychotics. Okay, so that's all about schizophrenia. And we would finish our lecture tonight with this. All good? There is also a, another topic called delusional disorder, which we will discuss later on. So no worries with that. So I know that this was a lot of information for the first class, right? And if you had any difficulty to understand, you can ask me here again, and I can go through them. Otherwise, we'll, we'll go through some question and answer. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask me now about the course. And in between that, I will show you what the course is going to include.
Okay, so most of you have seen our course details in First Aid AMC MCQ group. So the course is starting from 8th of October. Tonight was a trial class, but you will, this is not our, just the last trial class. You are going to have a free two week session with us, which will start from 8th October. And the schedule for those two weeks will be given in this First Aid AMC MCQ group. Now, as we say that we have the best organized software where you can have everything that you need for your exam. So all the class materials, so notes, video recordings of the class, and also an unlimited software-based mock exams are there. So the course include full theory discussion. So each of our theory classes will be more or less same like tonight class. We also try to cover five year sample question starting from 2018 to 20. In your course, we will add up to 2024 and we do monthly update as well. Up to now, we have done one or two class every week on monthly question solvation. But now, because there will be more mentors, so you will get two or three class. So two or three, just not just one, two or three class every week just on monthly question solvation, which means that the, the classes are going to increase a little bit. So now we take, most of the time, we take classes on, we, class, we take class on Sunday, Tuesday, and also on Saturday. So Saturday, Sunday, Tuesday is usually our classes, but because we are adding another question solve classes, so that will be in that will be added as well in your course. So most likely it will be on Thursday. So Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. So we'll have a look at when when our mentors are available and we will add that class as well. So four classes in a week. That's the most likely format that we are going to follow so that you get more question solved classes with us and you can you can you can understand how the questions come in exam okay so also you get our software based different format of mock exams you get a q bank free of charge access to the course note until you pass and you get a recording of every class after after usually within 24 hours of class now duration of the course is 5 months the course fee is 499 Australian dollar. As I said, the class ideally it is three days a week, but nowadays I'm thinking about making it four days a week. All the classes are live classes. We don't just give recordings of the previous batch and then finish the course. Every class will be recorded. Class most likely is going to start from 8:30 because there is uh, the daylight saving time is coming up in October, so it will start from 8.30. So what we cover in the course is complete theory, and we do theory-based question discussion, like we have done psychiatry, and then we will do psychiatry question solve. If we do surgery, we will do a surgery question solve after having all the surgery theory done. Then in your portal or in your software, you will be able to practice the theory based mock exam like we have cardiology mock exam surgery mock exam so once we finish a theory you should be able to find that how much how much preparation you have taken for that particular theory by appearing that mock exam we will this we will have this five years recent sample question discussion but obviously we can't discuss five year sample question in a course there will be some recorded classes from the past but Ideally, we will be focusing on the recent ones. So 2023 and 2024 will be our main focus. But in, your, in our portal, you have got a huge collection of question solved classes from 2018. So there is a huge collection of questions that you can go through. And if you can finish those, there is nothing else that can come in your come in any exam. Okay. After we do a recent mock, recent question solve like let's say we have done a september question solve classes then we will add a september question mock exam 
in your portal and you can also appear there. So that's called sub that's called monthly mock exam. Now our software based mock test has been divided into subjective, so theory based, then monthly, and then there is grand mock test, which has all like 150 questions in there. Currently, there are three grand mock tests available in the portal, but we are adding two more in this, in this year. So there will be five grand mock tests, which is more than enough for you to know that if you're well prepared for your exam, okay? We talked about QBank and then extra classes will be taken on ECG, all the imaging like X-ray, CT scan, CTG, STAT. So all the extra classes are there. We talked about, so you will get all the necessary books that you need on as a soft copy. We will also discuss about how to prepare for your next step, like what will be your next step, job hunting and registrations. Those will be discussed as well. And also, if you are a member of RACGP or ACRAM, you should be able to add our classes and, and claim some CPDs as well. So that's all about the course. As, as I say that the course has everything already in very well organized way. If you can give time and if you can join the classes like we asked you to do, there is no way you should fail this exam. If you have any queries or you want to start admission, us an email in here, okay? Or you can go to our website for any other information. Any question, guys? Now, one other thing is that if any of you, because this is a five months course, let's say if someone is going for an exam in November or October, can you still join this course? Yes, you can. The only thing is that we add all our previous batch recorded class in your portal as well. And in that way, you can finish it in your own time. So even within a month, you can finish everything if you give enough time, because all the recorded classes are already will be added in your portal. So if you, any of you has got a exam placement this year, we will provide that for you anyway. So there is no problem on that. And you can always join the live sessions if you like. Yes, Dr. Tharindu. So the next next sessions and all the class schedules of the free two week sessions will be given to your facebook group so ideally our next sessions will be focusing on tips and tricks of question solve and then we will start with cardiology classes and you will also get some question solve classes with other mentors but the full schedule will be uploaded and the next class should be on 8th of october and that will be our starting of free two weeks class. And same Dr. Shuponi, the paid course is going to start from 8th October. The, we allow everyone to join initial two weeks class. And after that, obviously the paid students will go on. And Dr. Chamindi, we don't have any individual class, sorry. It's all the same class like this. There will be no hard copy of the class notes. All the class notes will be available in the portal, so you can go through them. The question solve classes will be online, so live classes, and also the previous batch, like if we have taken some previous, if we have taken some question solve classes on previous batch, that will be also added in your portal. So that part is offline. So let's say 2019 or 2021 class, that will be added as an offline and you can go through that recording. But the, every week we are going to take at least two, two question solve classes, which are live. And for payment, Dr. Iman, just give us, either send me an inbox in, under Dr. Arshan Ahmed in the Facebook, or you can send us an email.
and today's recording in the portal so we will upload that in the portal most likely tomorrow because it takes about a about 24 hours to do that yes so if you're planning to give exam after march so the class notes all the notes will be accessible notes exams everything will be accessible in your in your portal even after the five months course the video access the recording access will be for 10 months dr sana khalid yes the next class is going to start from 8 october so this was our trial class and the the main course is starting from 8 october and the initial two weeks will be free and that's a part of the full course anyway And that's right, Dr. Amima. So many of our students, they can't finish in five months. So yes, we provide support after the course too. Yes, the portal gives feedback. Like it keeps the feedback about like uh, how, how much time you have taken for a particular question. And also obviously it gives a feedback about what is your, what's the right answer you have chosen and what's the, What's the correct answer? It gives an explanation of the answer as well. So portal is very good on that part. Is there any other source to know about updates other than Facebook group? No. So all the updates are given on our Facebook group. And as I say, Dr. Eamon, the next session will be on 8th of October. There is no admission form. It's all online, Dr. Eamon. So if you can send us an email or inbox, we will send you what is the information that you need. The books are given as a PDF version in Google Drive not in the portal books are very because it is very big ones so sometimes it takes a long time for the portal to open such a long long book so we don't add them on the portal we give you as a pdf version yes dr sajia all mcqs will be provided in the portal for practice There is no limited seat for the course because many of our students just do the course offline. So there is no limited seats. The deadline for the payment is as soon as you do the payment, we will add you to the portal and you can start seeing, seeing our class videos, class notes, which is actually better rather than waiting. If you like the course, I would suggest to get admitted as soon as possible because the portal the admission or getting access into the portal takes some time because at this moment everyone is sending us messages we are adding everyone at the same time so our team is already under a lot of stress so it can take a little bit of time to get access so we advise to do it as soon as possible but the deadline should be once we finish our two week session then the deadline will be at that time So likely chance that the deadline for the payment should be the third week of October. And yes, Dr. Nuwan, we, as I said that every month, so we do the monthly question solve classes. So any, any, anyone appearing exam in September, October, November, those monthly questions we solve anyway. And Dr. Chamin, the, I don't think we can help you because you have only two weeks and two weeks is not enough for us to, to give you everything. So I'm not sure like how I can help you within just two weeks. It will be difficult. And Dr. Charles, portal will be opened as soon, 
as soon as you make the payment and then we will send it to our team member and then the team member will have a look about on your account and then they usually give the access so we have already written on the, on your face on the facebook group that how and when we are going to add the paid students so you can have a look if you have already paid but at the moment even after paying it can take about a week to get the access because because of a lot of workload at the moment the books will be provided as a pdf so it will be a link and you can download in that way so none of the we don't allow anything to be downloaded because we allow everything will be in the portal so everything until you pass in the pass the exam everything is in your portal so you can always log in and and go through any lecture notes any videos there is no installment i don't think there should be any exam in december or january so it should not be the case and only one device can log in at one time okay but you can lo log in from multiple multiple devices but at one point you can only log in one time okay all good everyone that should clear your doubts i hope but if there is any other questions anything that you want to know you can always send us an email and we can discuss if there is any personal questions anything like that you can always ask us okay and there is two weeks free sessions coming up anyway so feel free to ask questions feel free to get well oriented about the exam because that's all that matters okay and remember one thing that everything is already given all that you need to do is to understand what is important to prepare and not to waste any more time if you have already paid for the course and if you have got access to the portal i would suggest that start looking into our previous batch recorded classes start doing some questions get some study partner so that you can solve questions with them as well and if you haven't got access or if you are if you if you're still thinking about starting your preparation get the john mutak book in your one side and on another side you start your handbook so you start reading the handbook and the jam and then just do some some preparation at least okay and when once we start in full rhythm from 8th october you will be you will be in in a real flow and you can easily gain the pace okay Thank you, everyone. We'll finish it here tonight. Have a good night.